So once again, this is What's the Deal with Data? Data Fundamentals for Nonprofit Staff. So today we are going to be talking about what data is and why it matters. We'll go through some different data words and data checks. We'll talk about how to be a good data consumer and a good data producer. And then we'll talk through where the data you're collecting goes and then what you can do with the good data. So for a quick icebreaker, we're hoping you can um, add your name, again, pronouns if you'd like, and organization to the chat, along with one way that data impacts your job. And I'll give you a second to do that. I'll, I'll also ask if there are a couple people willing to share. I guess if you don't know how data might impact your job, that's fine to say too. Great. So Kristen is bringing up grant writing and funding. Those are two really good ways you're going to use data. Do we have a comment or? Reporting, program improvement. Yes, great. All right. Well, please. Um, if you have more to add there, please continue to do so. We're going to circle back to some of those reasons in a bit. But I'm going to transition into what is data. So when we say data, what does that mean to you? We're going to put up a quick poll to see what you think. So please take a moment and just select all of the things you think apply. Hopefully you see the results now. Oh, great. Uh, so yeah, I think most of you are nailing this on the head. So data can be all sorts of things. Um, Heather, if we go to the next slide. So as many of you said, data can be numbers, words, images, measurements, observations, descriptions, historical or legal documents. It can come from surveys, intake forms, case notes, 
audio, video, kind of anything you're engaging with can be data, which makes it complicated and cool that you can collect all sorts of data. So circling back to how data impacts your job or role, I was seeing earlier the, the grant writing, the reporting, learning about the families you're serving. And Heather, did you see anything else in the chat? Uh, no, just, for, yeah, a lot of mentions of reporting, uh, reporting to funders uh, for grant writing, understanding your program where there may be opportunities for program and process improvement. Great. Yeah, those are all really important. All right, so there are two ways, and you've mentioned a lot of these, but they, they fall under these two categories of how data might be affecting your job or your role. And the first is that you're consumers of data. And by that, I mean, you use data for a specific purpose and are affected by the quality of that data. And so in other words, um, a lot of the things you just mentioned, you're using data in your job to improve the work you do or that your organization does to get funding to understand and track client progress and so on. And then secondly, you're also likely producers of data. And if you're a home visitor, you or direct service staff, you likely produce most of the data your organization collects through surveys or different client assessments you might be collecting over the course of a year. So the best way to interact with data as a consumer or producer is to always stay curious. You're always wanting to ask yourself, what does this data mean? How should I be understanding this data? And does it make sense? Does, does this have a logical flow to it? So again, we are coming back to some things you've already mentioned here, but we know that data is pretty much everything and everywhere, but it can feel kind of tedious um, when you're having to do data entry. It can be time consuming. It can cut into the time you spend with your clients and families. So you wanna be able to keep in mind why you're giving your valuable time to data collection or data entry. And so first, as we've mentioned, it can keep you funded. So most of your organizations are getting money from contracts and grants. And that means you're typically obligated to report to those funders, such as Best Starts for Kids, and data is required for reporting so without it, you can lose your funding, which means no salaries, no office spaces, and so on. But data just isn't just for models and funders, it's also for you. It can really help keep you motivated. It can help you understand what's going well, what needs improvement with your organization. It helps you understand where your clients are at and how they might be progressing. And it reminds you why you continue to do the important work that you're doing. Data also helps you better serve your clients by giving you clues, evidence, and stories. You can really get the real story and evidence from clients so you can advocate for them and improve services. It can help you identify potential gaps in the services being offered, and it allows you to be responsive to any emerging needs that your families and clients might have. So as we go through the presentation today, we'll have two different types of slides, data words and data checks, and data words are important terms that are good to understand when we're talking about data. And then data checks are going to be clues to look out for or ways that you should check data that you are producing or consuming to make sure it's reliable. 
and this will help you be a good consumer of data. The first data word is, uh, oh, I think we skipped a slide. There we go, thank you. <laughs> the first data word is qualitative data. And this is data that reflects the viewpoints of people being researched. So we often use this to explore a topic and collect descriptive information. So some of the ways you might have seen or even collected qualitative data yourself are through interviews, focus group discussions, community cafes, observations, photo voice projects, and so on. The next important word to know is quantitative data. And this is data expressed in numbers. So common ways that you might be collecting quantitative data are surveys, like satisfaction surveys or evaluations after a training, experiments, or through assessments, um, like the ASQ or P PHQ-9. And then when we use qualitative and quantitative methods together, that's often referred to as mixed methods. So we have a pop quiz now, just what you all wanted, I'm sure. <laughs> um, we're going to put up uh, one poll. Tell us what type of data you think this is. Give you a second to respond to that. Is this shared now, Heather? I can't quite, okay, thanks. Yes, so this is qualitative data. So um, there's a hint in there about focus group transcript, um, but this will be people's thoughts and opinions that have been transcribed after a focus group conversation. So you're really getting that qualitative input from folks. And I think we have one more. Great, 100% here. So yes, this is quantitative information. So things like weight and height and age are all going to be numbers that we use. So that would be considered quantitative data. Great job. Okay, the next data word is population. And this refers to all of the possible people in a group. So it might be clients in a program, all of the students at a school, all the members in a particular community, and so on. A sample then is a group that you've pulled from that population. And you can pull them through random sampling or non-random sampling, which we'll talk about. So one of, the, one of the good ways to be a good data consumer is to understand sampling. Random sampling is where every person has an equal chance of being selected to participate. And this is considered the gold standard because it helps cancel out the effects of any unobserved factors. 
So for instance, if you wanted to know the average height in the city, a random sample would help you account for factors that might affect height, like different ages, genders, regions, and so on. Without a random sample, your estimate of average height would end up being biased. So then non-random sampling are, is a little straightforward. It's when participants are selected in non-random ways. And so some of these you might have used before, such as convenient sampling, where you um, ask people you know to take a survey, for instance. Or snowball sampling is when you have your initial contacts spread the word to their contacts about this survey. Um, so you can get a little bit of a, a sample group. And these are often unavoidable, especially when you have a difficult to reach population, but it does lead to bias data. So going back to that example of trying to figure out the average height of people in Seattle, if I was going to use a non-random convenient sample, what might be the problem with using people in my family to determine the average height of people in Seattle? And feel free to use the chat or unmute yourself. I'll throw out an answer that uh, people in my family are very short. I am tall for my family. And, uh, <laughs> and yeah, I'm really sure I'm below average height. So if you only sample people in my family, you would think that everyone was really short. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And Kirsten said something similar, height is genetic. So exactly, if I just sampled people from my family, we're probably around the same height and whether that's short or tall or average, it's not representative of Seattle as a whole. The other thing um, that might make family a problem are the ages of people in your family. So are there more kids than adults or vice versa? And obviously you would expect the children might be shorter than adults and so how does that throw off your average? So then similar question, if I extended this non-random sample to my social network, what might be the problem with that? Um, if, for example, in my social network, there's only like women and then I cannot sample that because in the, in the city of Seattle is not only one category. Yeah. Thanks, Sharon. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. Yeah, we tend, our social networks tend to be a lot of people of similar sex to us. Anyone else? Stephanie, are you explaining what you mean by biased sample? Sure. Um, just that it will trend probably away from the average. So you'll, in this example, you might end up with an average height that's 
much shorter than the actual average or much taller than the actual average, depending on who you sampled. So again, if you sampled a bunch of kids around age 10, you'd get a much different average height than if you sampled the same number of adults and took their average height. So yeah, as Sharon mentioned, um, gender can have an effect. Our social network um, might have people of similar ages, so that's going to affect height. Um, you might have similar nationalities where um, that could affect height. So there's lots of different ways that using just our personal connections might be problematic. Okay, so then if we randomly selected people to participate in Seattle, we're more likely to get folks from all different age groups and genders, nationalities, and all of those things we just mentioned, and then we'll get a better idea of true average height. So hopefully this example helps you understand a little bit about why a random sample gives you better or more accurate data than a non-random sample. So this brings us to our first data check, which is understanding sampling size or sample size and sampling method. So when you're looking at data, it's important to know how many people were part of a study or research because small samples of a large population are typically not going to be very representative or they'll be biased. And then understanding how people were sampled, again, randomly or non-randomly, um, will help you understand if whatever was found in the study accurately represents the larger population. So as a good data consumer, it's also important to understand the relationship between data points. So there are some relationships you might see out there like between age and height. As you get older, you will likely get taller. Um, if you smoke, you are more likely to develop lung cancer. If you have a good relationship with your doula while you're pregnant, you might see improved birth weight of your baby. If your ASQ, your ages and stages questionnaire scores improve, you're more likely to be ready for kindergarten and so on. So thinking about that um, relationship between things, if you look at these items in this table, what are some possible relationships that you would pull out of this? Again, please shout out, use the chat, whichever you're comfortable with. Maybe I'll start you off with one. Um, the country of origin and favorite snacks. I think these are going to be related because there are different food preferences and different food options in different areas. So if I grow up in one country, I'm likely going to like different snacks than if I grow up in a different country. Can anyone else share maybe one connection here? I can try. Great. The number of languages spoken with um, employment status Great. in a way. You want me to explain? Yeah, please. So uh, I'm thinking like the people that buy Lengos, they can be um, ready for certain job because they speak both language and serve. I don't know how to say it in English anyways. <laughs> yeah. So that they could Yeah, that's great. I, I think that I see all the time requests for 
bilingual, multilingual. Um, so it's needed and wanted. So yes, I think you're absolutely right. Oh, great. And um, Ash said employment status and education completed. Great. Annual income and employment status. Yes, you'd expect that if you're employed, you probably have a higher annual income than if you are unemployed. Great. And then Gregory. I really also liked Gregory. Yeah, sorry, Heather. Oh, I'm Go sorry, ahead. I missed one. Yeah, Gregory mentioned number of languages spoken and country of origin. Yes, absolutely. Favorite snack and age, yes, <laughs> definitely. Sounds like a parent. Yes. <laughs> These are perfect, yes. So you, you, you can see uh, as you're looking through data, there are a lot of things that just are naturally going to make sense that there's going to be a relationship between them. Okay, so another data word is correlation. And this means when one measure is related to another. We're gonna look at an example. So what is the relationship between weight and height? Someone responded over there. So you would expect that taller people might weigh more because they have more body to be weighed on average than shorter people. So this graph um, is displaying that. And I wondered if anybody knew what type of graph this is or would be willing to try to read it for us. Oh, positive correlation, yes. Gregory's on top of it, yes. Growth? Yes. Do you know, do you know which, what type of graph this is? Great, yeah, scatter plot. Exactly. So yes, we can see it's not, not, not everything falls exactly on this line, but that you're generally trending up. As you increase in height, your weight also increases. Great. So then there's causation. And this one can be a little bit more difficult to determine than a correlation because there are usually a lot of different factors that contribute to actually causing something else. So causation just means one measure causes another. And you may have heard the phrase, correlation is not causation. And that's an important thing to remember because correlation just means something's related to another thing versus causation, which again means that one thing is causing the other thing. So research does uncover causal links at times, such as the one between smoking and lung cancer. So people who smoke cigarettes are 15 to 30 times more likely to get lung cancer than people who do not smoke. So now, we are going to put up another poll in a second, but looking at this graph, do you see a correlation or causation or neither between ice cream sales and murder rates?
Great, yeah. So this one is tricky, but it, it's a good example of why you should be suspicious of how data is presented to you. Um, because although the graph makes it look like ice cream sales and murder rates might be correlated, if you think about those two things, there's actually really no connection between them. And the reason they look like they're correlated is because of another factor, which is heat or the temperature outside. So both ice cream sales and murder rates increase when temperatures get warmer. So warmer temperatures are correlated with increased ice cream sales and warmer temperatures are correlated with increases in homicide, but ice cream and homicides thankfully are not related. So I, we use that example not to be confusing, but again, just to be thinking about how is data presented to you and is it giving you the full story or are there more data points to consider? Is this, is this the whole story um, or what else, what else might be affecting these two things? All right, so our next data check involves watching for those causal claims. So thinking through if an article or report you're reading implies that a study found a direct link between two variables, does that seem plausible? Or is it actually, um, is it actually a causation or correlation? Or is it some other variable altogether making it appear as though two unrelated things are connected. Do you mind if we do a quick check before break just to see if anyone has any questions on anything so far? Yes, please. Questions or comments, thoughts about any of this? Gregory, I'm not sure of, about your question. Is it a plot point? Was that on a, a specific slide? That was the scatter plot. Yeah. Oh, scatter plot. Okay. Yep. Yeah, and Kavina said that too. Scatter plot with positive correlation and a few outliers. Nice yeah. Job. Perfect. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Heather. Um, did anyone think of any questions on break or comments about anything? Great. <laughs> right. Okay, thank you. All right, so we have been talking about all of these different aspects of being an informed consumer. So somebody who's consuming data, what are things you might want to understand and things to think about? Another really important aspect is the source of data, meaning where did that data come from? Who produced that data? And the question really is, did they have an agenda or who benefits from this data? So for example, a lot of the research we have on cigarettes in the United States was actually done by cigarette companies, right? So could there be some possible you know, motivation there for the data to turn out a particular way? Or after years and years of hundreds of studies saying that lesbian and gay, bisexual, transgender families have great outcomes, a few years ago, there was an article that said there were actually bad outcomes for children with uh, LGBT parents. But <clears throat> when you looked at who wrote the article, they were being funded by an anti-LGBT organization, right? So that source is really important. Another example is a few years ago, a white supremacist organization actually bought the domain martinlutherking.org. And when you see .org, you think, oh, that's official, that's from the government. And so they made it, you know, they tried to make it look a little bit official, but they published a bunch of really terrible articles with, you know, what they called research about how 
Martin Luther King was a violent person and that slavery wasn't that bad. It was really terrible. So you really, it's always important to look what is the source and what do they have to gain? <clears throat> so really there are a few data checks that we recommend when it comes to the source. So first is source authority. Who published that research? What organization? And what other types of research do they publish? Do they seem to have a particular agenda? It's always good practice. Let's say if you're doing a little research into, you know, what can I learn about being a home visitor? Or what do I need to learn about families that have been through trauma? You know, those things as you're just doing research to improve in your work, check the About Us page and make sure that the URL is spelled correctly. Make sure that you're at a reputable site and maybe check a couple other sources right before believing something entirely. And also just, is it a reputable source, reputability? Are there other sources that are also talking about this topic? Are they including similar data or information? Or if this is the only site with that information, maybe look and see if it's real news or not, or if it's even satire, or if it's something that has an agenda. And then there's sponsored research. Who's actually paying for it? And what motive might they have for the research to turn out a particular way? And some news sites have sponsored content. And of course, you're supposed to say if it's sponsored content, but it doesn't always say that. But when you do see that, it means that the article was written uh, for payment. And so it may actually be more of an opinion piece, but it may look like news, right? So just making sure that you're kind of looking critically at the source of your data. And then there's numbers, right? Data, you usually get it sent back to you in numbers. And this is another important aspect of being a data consumer. When you see these numbers, how should you understand them? What do they really mean? So you can go ahead, Heather, this one has a few clicks. All right, so my point here with this slide, we'll think about the difference between seeing a number versus a rate. And I'll tell you what that means here as we go through this. So let's say that you hear this number. Fatima is one of your home visitors and she completed six home visits. Okay, that is a number. Numbers are good, that's interesting, but what does that tell you? And remember we said earlier, a great way to deal with data is to always stay curious and ask, okay, so how should I understand that number? So next click here. Was it six home visits in a year? Okay, well, that is not very many, I would say. Of all the home visitors I've met, you do a lot more home visits than that. So that might be a little strange. Okay, well, was it one week? Okay, all right, maybe stay curious about it. That's a little bit more reasonable, but I would wanna know, well, what is Fatima's caseload? And is that an appropriate number based on what you know about being a home visitor, based on what you know about Fatima's workload? Is it in one day? okay, that is a very long day. So is Fatima a superhuman or is she not spending enough time on each visit, right? So as soon as you know a little bit more information about that number, it helps you understand the number a little bit more. So when you see just a number, it's good to ask, okay, what else? It's good to get a little bit more information. So the next slide has an example. All right, so let's say you see a headline that makes this claim. 1,000 King County families are at risk of being evicted. Well, immediately, that's going to start to tug at my heartstrings, right? And I mean, that alarms you. You think, well, no family should be evicted. And that's true, right? So if you see 1,000 families are at risk of being evicted, that might get you, you know, alarmed. You might be worried about that as we should be, but we are smart consumers of data and we're curious. So we say, okay, what does that mean? 1,000 families. The first thing I would want to know is, well, how many families live in King County? So how can I understand this number? So I did a quick Google search. And as of 2019, there were over 900,000 households. Okay, so maybe households and families aren't a perfect measure, right? And that's definitely something to pay attention to. But let's say that's a pretty good ballpark. 
that there are 907,000 households and probably more now, right? So this is what you do with those numbers. You do a little bit of math. So you take, okay, there's 1,000 families and you divide it by the total population of families, right? So 1,000 divided by that number, 907,761. And you'll see that it's 0.11%. That's not 11%, that's one-tenth of 1%. 1 so that means out of every 1,000 households, about one is at risk of being evicted. And of course, every eviction is awful. It's terrible. But when you have a little bit more information, you can determine what, what do I need to do? What, how should I feel about that number? Can you click one more time? All right, so this is one out of every 1,000. If you can see at the top left of this little picture, tiny, tiny, there's one pink dot. So it's one pink dot out of a thousand. Again, all evictions are terrible. That is what we're dealing with. So now you can understand how to react to it. All right. And so when you do that math and you get that percentage, that's a rate. So that's when you can say, okay, one out of approximately every thousand households. That's a rate. So that's very different from a number. All right. Next slide. So what if then, let's look at this differently. What if it were 1,000 Redmond families? That's where my family lives. So I would, you know, I'd be curious about that. And so I did the same search, did a quick Google search. How many families live in Redmond? Well, it's about 26,000 households. It's a very different number than when you're talking about Seattle. So then do the math. Okay, again, so it's 1,000. You divide it by that number, 3.8%. Okay, that's almost 4%. That's a little bit different. That's one out of every 25 households. That gets to be a lot more alarming. So one in every thousand households versus one in every 25 households, it, it looks different, right? And so just showing you what that looks like visually, four out of a hundred dots versus one out of a thousand dots. So again, all evictions being terrible, it still is helpful to understand the extent of an issue when you're looking at rates instead of just numbers alone. So then of course that brings us to another data check and that is manipulated data. Are, when you're reading about data, are they giving you numbers or are they giving you rates? Are they giving you enough information to understand what that number means? And have the findings been exaggerated to seem to put you to give you more fear to get you more panicked or to get more sort of emotion out of you it's always good to go to the original source of the study and good reputable sources online will give you a link to the original study so you can see it and just make sure that the findings are really matching up with what you're seeing and make sure that they are discussing it in a way that gives you enough information to understand what that number means. And I've got a couple examples of manipulated data for you. This first one is from a USA Today article. Um, is anyone comfortable telling us what type of chart do you see there? Of course, you can use the chat or you can unmute. That is a bar chart, right? So you can see that there is a bar that is supposed to be showing you related to each other, how much percentage they are compared to each other, right? So if you just look at this, what it looks like is 5.2% of children suffer from a spinal injury, right? This says it's common injuries that children suffer. And when you look at the source, which is always what I do, I always go to the source first, it says that it's the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. That's a, that's a reputable source. So are you telling me that 5% of children have a spinal injury and almost 22% of children have a traumatic thigh bone injury? Really, if you look up the numbers, the real figure for spinal injuries is 0.00000003%. Right. 
it's actually really tiny. But what USA Today did is they made it look more, way more scary than it actually is. I think what they're trying to say is that as of all of the kids, if you look at the kids who actually do have a traumatic injury, this is the percentage. So of the population of children, there's a sample that may have this traumatic injury. Of that sample, 5.2% have a spinal injury, right? It's very misleading when you just see it. It puts you in a panic, right? So very different story. Again, all injuries are terrible, but it helps you sort of understand a little bit more of the story when you think about it a little bit more critically. And really you can just Google and say, okay, well, how many kids are really injured? You know, you could try to do research to understand that. There's one more example. All right, this says that over 100 million are now receiving federal welfare, right? And this is another type of bar chart, but this time the bars are going up and down instead of sideways. Right. So again, what it looks like is that there's been this dramatic increase in the number of people receiving federal benefits. And when you look at the census or the sources of the U.S. Census, which I mean, should be good. But then I don't know, does anyone see anything that seems strange about this or any, any additional information to help us understand this? As a professor, so I can leave lots of awkward silences. <laughs> Figure includes anyone residing in a household in which at least one person receives a program benefit. Interesting, yes, good observation, right? So then that's a good question. How are they measuring that? How are they figuring that out, right? And then Bethany gave a hint, who is it produced by? What, what I thought was interesting was looking at, if you, so if you're looking at a chart, there's, a, there's usually an X axis, which is what we call the line at the bottom. And then a Y axis is the one that goes up and down, right? When you see a chart like this. If you look at the Y axis, so if you look at the numbers on the side there, the numbers range, <clears throat> so sorry, from 94 million to 100 million. Right, so that's not going from zero to 100 million. That's going from 94 to 100. So any tiny change is going to look really big because uh, where the graph should be, you know, this big, they're only really showing this much of it. So it really distorts the story. It, again, it gets you fired up and it gets you afraid of like, oh my gosh, what's going on? And, but it's exaggerating real information. Bethany, what did you notice about? Uh, who it was produced by? That it is produced by the, um, it's very small for me, the um, com a Republican committee headed by Jeff Sessions, um, who may have interest in not providing welfare. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So it's always good to try to understand the nuance of who's trying to scare me and why, I guess, really, because a lot of the numbers and data we see are kind of scary. So very good observations. And then again, yeah, like Kirsten said, how was it even measured, right? So be on the lookout for, you know, those data manipulations. All right, thank you. All right, so kind of related to that, even more broadly, it's just it's good to be curious about the information that you're reading. So again, let's say you're doing some reading to get better at your job. I wanna read about infant mental health or breastfeeding in Somali families. You're gonna find all sorts of information and you wanna be able to tell what's good information versus what scare tactics or sensationalism. And you've probably heard a little bit about clickbait headlines. And the headline will say something that 
if you just see the headline, you think, oh my gosh, that's really, I can't believe that's happening. That's really scary. Well, does that really tell the whole story or is it just trying to get your attention to make you click on it, to get you tempted to click on it? What, what's the rest of the story that's missing from that title, right? It's always good to compare multiple articles to each other to see how other people are talking about it and see what might be manipulated there. And then there's that inflammatory language when people purse they specifically choose particular words that they know are gonna get you fired up. So if an article you're reading makes you feel angry or suggests that you need to be angry, is that news or is that an opinion piece, right? Is it different? There's, there's uh, different expectations for that. So again, try reading a few more articles from other outlets and chances are that one inflammatory one is probably using misleading or manipulative language. So fear really works. It grabs people attention and it gets a lot of clicks, but don't fall into that trap. Stay curious. Any questions or thoughts about data manipulation? All right, sorry, Heather, I keep tripping you up. We go forward and back, okay. All right, so data visualization we've seen a few examples data visualization is the way that data is shown in different visual ways right so when you do see data it can be shown in many ways there's all sorts of fun and sometimes boring ways that you can be looking at data there could be tables charts graphs infographics all sorts of fun things word clouds but the question is always the same okay so what is the data telling us so starting with this this is a table Right, so what is the data telling us? Is anyone willing to do a quick interpretation for us? I'll let y'all be quiet, but you know, it's way more entertaining if you speak and not us. All right, so the table tells us that, you know, it looks like a group of people were asked, what is your favorite Star Wars character? And then this is the count. This is the number of people who answered each of these uh, choices. So for Darth Vader, <clears throat> 20 people said that he was their favorite. And R2-D2, only got nine. I don't know how I feel about this. C-3PO, Boba Fett, right? So you can see for each of these characters, this is how many people chose them as their favorite. All right. Interesting, kind of boring reading in a table. So let's click. Okay. This is a little bit different. This again is that sort of bar chart, right? So it's the exact same information, but it is just laid out a little bit differently. It's presented a little bit differently. Anyone feel a preference for one way or the other? Apparently I like awkward silences. I'm gonna keep asking. Bar chart, <laughs> we gotta vote for the bar chart. Number two, oh yeah, okay. So all the capacity collective people agree that uh, bar chart. <laughs> yeah, the thing is, is that your brain can take in visuals much more quickly than it can words and numbers, right? So when you see the one on the right, you can see, okay, there's a big difference between Darth Vader's column and R2-D2's column, right? You can see that there's, oh, those are quite far apart. And Boba Fett, of course, is a little bit closer, but you can see visually that there's a big difference between each of those columns there, right? Those bars. So having data in bar charts is really helpful, right? It helps you see the numbers in comparison to one another instead of just seeing the numbers on their own. It's quick and easy to get the general feel of what the data is pretty quickly. So you'll notice that a lot of data gets presented that way instead of tables. And if you need to present data to get the board of directors to you know, say that your program is the best, maybe using data visualizations kind of utilizes the brain in a different way. All right, let's look at the next slide. 
Here is another way of looking at the same data. So again, we've got bar charts, but what's different about these compared to the slide before? Does anyone see anything different? Other than horizontal versus vertical? <laughs> Cute icons. The big difference is that these are percentages instead of numbers, right? So it's also helpful to see, are we talking about numbers or are we talking about percentages? Because then when you see, oh, that's more than a third of the people who were asked this question chose Darth Vader and the Boba Fett was slightly less than a third, right? So it's kind of just an interesting way that you're getting more pieces of information by using percentages versus numbers, right? So these are all really, helpful to see. And then again, same thing, but you're seeing it in, all right, well, what is this chart called? Definitely someone knows what this chart is. Pie chart, yes. <laughs> Who doesn't love pie? Right, so in a pie chart, again, you can kind of see relative to each other, you kind of see, wow, Darth Vader's slice is pretty big. And you can tell visually that it's kind of the biggest slice, right? So exact same data, but you can see it a little bit differently. So of course, if you want to learn more about all of the great ways you can show your data visually, our training in May is all about data visualizations and hopefully you've already signed up, but if not, we'll give you some emails at the end. You can always reach out and we'll see, we'll find you some space in there and make sure that you can join us for data visualization because it's a huge part of data, of course. All right, thank you. All right, so we have talked quite a bit about consuming data, right? So taking it in and understanding it. Now we're gonna switch gears and talk about being producers of data, right? So let's, so this is the other way that data really impacts your role. So not only are you understanding what you're seeing, but also what are you producing? You produce a lot of data, I'm guessing, especially as Bethany said earlier, if you're a doula, direct service, home visitor, but pretty much anyone working in your organization is probably producing some bit of data. You're probably producing some quantitative data and some qualitative data, as we talked about earlier. So you're producing numbers and you're producing those narratives, those case notes, those uh, observations, right? So you're producing a lot of data. And if you are direct service, you're probably the people who are most important in your organization for producing data because there's no way the program or organization can see how it's doing unless you put that data somewhere for them to see, right? So it's crucial that you put in good data. Just as you should be informed consumers of data, it's really good to be an informed producer of data. And that way your data can mean something. So when you go to make decisions based on data, you know that you're doing it with data that actually represents the lives of the communities you're serving. Right, so just as we gave time to being a consumer, let's talk about being a producer. And our first data word, which you've probably heard, and I always heard people talk about it when I worked at nonprofits before I went to school and learned more about data, but um, you, you frequently hear the word measure, or sometimes you hear it described as an indicator. As staff, you collect data that measures the success of a program that indicates if your work is making a difference. That's where that language comes from. It's the thing, the, the concept that you're trying to measure to understand your program or to demonstrate your success. You want to understand who you are serving, right? So you ask questions about age, gender, country of origin. Those help you understand who you're serving, right? That's the concept. And you probably ask questions about satisfaction. Or maybe you track goals, the progress and completion. Maybe you ask people questions about how comfortable they are navigating school, the school system, something like that, right? Those are measures. Those are things that you're trying to understand. So if you ask somebody at the beginning of their time in your program, do you feel comfortable navigating the U.S. school system? And they say, no, not very well. And then you ask them a year later and they say, yes, very well. 
that indicates that maybe time in your program helped them to feel more comfortable navigating the US school system. Right? So it's how you measure what you're trying to understand. The next word that you are definitely hearing all the time, I'm guessing, is outcome. And sometimes you'll hear output and outcome. And those are a little bit different. Outputs are usually just the numbers. Like, okay, we served 600 families in 2021. The outcome is that sort of bigger result of the work you're doing. So 75% of our families report that they're reading to their child more often than they did before they were in the program, right? So those outcomes are what your program is trying to understand. What outcomes do your programs measure? Are people willing to share either in chat or unmute? What is an outcome that you measure? Frequency of times per week parents read with their children. Yeah, I actually have CRB in mind for many of these examples. Navigating school systems, <laughs> reading to their children. Absolutely. Yes. Any other outcomes? I know our doula programs measure breastfeeding rate at birth, at six months, things like that, right? All right. Next slide. <laughs> All right. So. As we've said, you collect a lot of data. And I think one of the things about data that feels really tedious is that you're always putting it in the system and putting it in the system and putting it in the system, but it just seems like it's going off into the abyss. There's no way of knowing what happens to that data. Where does it all, why are you making me put all these numbers in the system, right? And I think that can be really frustrating is that you're always sitting at a computer screen, but that isn't why you went into this field of work. You to you went into this work so you could make differences and help people and work with people, but then you're spending all this time putting data into this magic box and it goes off into space. So where does it go? It helps to know a few more data words to talk about this. So starting here at the left, this is a form, right? Your program probably uses a bunch of forms. They can be paper forms, electronic forms, those are your data collection tools. So sometimes it looks like an intake form, sometimes it's a home visiting form, a survey, something like that. All right, this form is made up of fields. And so this is also language if you are working in a database, like if you've been working on getting into Apricot with our team, you've probably heard us talk about fields, right? Forms and fields. The fields are those spaces, those boxes that collect that piece of information. So a uh, last name, a date of birth, a phone number, something like that. Those are your fields, those are those boxes. And then even if those fields or those fields all seem random, they are measured. They're measuring some sort of aspect of the program, that concept, right? So sometimes they're measuring on their own something and sometimes they're combined with other fields. So let's say, your form is a survey that you give out after a training, like we do. We send you an evaluation form for you to fill out after the survey because we genuinely want to know what we can do to make the program better or to our uh, trainings better. So the participants, when we send that form, are going to put their answers in fields. They're highly satisfied, somewhat dissatisfied, whatever it is. Those responses give us a measure of satisfaction with the training. And then we can use it to indicate whether or not people are satisfied with our training. It helps us make decisions. So, all right, so let's measure. So then those measures, when you put them together with the responses from the other respondents, you can calculate outcomes. Okay, what is the result of the work we're doing? What types of things are we impacting? Are we impacting people's confidence in their parenting? Are we serving those who need us most? Right? So those outcomes, again, are those results. And then that data usually gets reported. Right? So for example, BSK asks for monthly reports, quarterly reports, 
semi-annual reports, right? And those reports, every one of them asks for a different set of outcomes. So if you're the person who does reporting in your organization, which many of you are, you know, <laughs> a lot of data ends up getting reported to funders or to upper management, to board of directors, things like that, models, right? So your supervisors, program managers, directors are likely taking all of those measures, calculating some outcomes and reporting them to a funder or a model. So let's look at a specific example here. Most programs have something like an intake form. Again, that could be paper or electronic. And you probably ask a bunch of questions, gender, gender identity being one that's pretty common, right? So that is, so you're gonna have a field that says something like gender or gender identity, male, female, non-binary, or maybe man, woman, non-binary, right? So that's a field that you probably have on your intake form. Well, that allows you to measure, well, how many women are enrolled in our program? And then you can compare that to men or you can compare it to non-binary individuals. And then you can use those numbers to figure out your outcomes. Okay, so you may see that 80% of the people enrolling in your program are women. And then you can look, okay, is that more than last year? Is it less than last year? And you can see who seems to benefit from our program more, women, men, non-binary folks. So that one field becomes really powerful when you start to talk about the relationships, like we talked about earlier, the relationships between gender and other fields and other measures that have been collected. And now that you have this outcome that 80% of our enrollees are women, you can report that to funders, the board of directors, or to your communities. So it could be we're enrolling more women than we did three years ago. But it could be we're enrolling more men than we did three years ago. Maybe we need to do more services for fathers and not always focus on mothers, right? So it really helps you. That one, again, that one field can give you all of this really powerful data. Right, but going back to this example of the BSK semi-annual report, that's everyone's favorite. Right now, BSK asks all of their funded programs to report a bunch of outcomes every January and July. So someone from your program, maybe it's you, maybe not, has to take all of that data and shape it into a report just the way that BSK wants it. And that's always a good time, right? But that's really just the beginning of the story. As sort of painful as that can be, there are a lot more steps even after that. So your, you or your, somebody in your program collects all that data together, sends it to BSK. BSK takes all of that data and puts it with all of the other programs. And then they also collect all this other data from other sources, school districts, health departments, all sorts of government agencies. And they, because it's taxpayer funded, they are supposed to be putting all of the data in a place where anyone should be able to find it and anyone should be able to look at it. So has anyone ever looked at the BSK dashboards? It's action packed yet, yeah, got some thumbs up. Yeah, it's actually, I mean, it's, it's a lot. It's a little bit intense, but there's a lot in there to, to be found. So let's take a look. The first thing you'll see is there's that data word, indicator, right? So these are the best starts for kids indicators. And Heather has dropped the link into the chat if you want to look yourself and say, okay, after all of this data that you're making me put into the computer, where does it go? This is where it goes. All right. So you'll see that there's a couple of ways that you can look at data here. You can search for a particular indicator, right? And there's a box for that, a search box, or you can browse based on the type of programs you want to know about. So let's try both ways. Let's start by searching for an indicator. And I remember the first thing I learned about BSK is they wanted all kids to be kindergarten ready. So let's do a search for kindergarten. All right, make sure I can see here. 
All right, did we do some shit? Okay, yeah, I should have explained that. So there's all of these, you put a, an indicator here, and right now it's looking at all of these different topic areas. But as soon as you put kindergarten, it knows it's only going to measure it for prenatal to five. So now it's telling you in the topic area of prenatal to five, there's an indicator called kindergarten readiness. And then there's a description of that. When you click on it, it actually takes you to the office of the superintendent for public instruction. So it allows you to actually see okay, what's going on with kindergarten readiness in King County? And then you can see, has it, has it changed over time? Are we having an impact? Is all of this BSK work actually making a difference? So you can click on kindergarten readiness and it gives you this interactive map. So when you hover over particular areas, it will tell you a percentage of readiness, right? So if you are over Auburn, you'll see it's, 33.6% kindergarten readiness. Snoqualmie blue tells you it's 78.5% ready, right? That's a huge difference between uh, Auburn and Snoqualmie, right? Pretty interesting. So that can help tell you where your clients are. How's kindergarten readiness going? And then you can go to this demographics tab and it goes from being an interactive map to this bar chart, right? And it breaks up kindergarten ready readiness by various demographic groups. So then ideally, we and King County should be able to look and see, are we really leveling the playing field? It's all in there available for us to look. So it's pretty fascinating that you can look at it in all these different ways. And then you'll see there's a tab there that says trends. Right? So it does actually show you how King County's kindergarten readiness has changed over time. And I mean, we all know when we're moving, when we're trying to move the needle on something huge, like kindergarten readiness, that things take time. But it's here for you to be able to browse and look and see, has there been any other, any changes over time? And of course, it takes years to measure those things. And honestly, that's why you have to put in data now so that it can keep compiling and keep calculating so that you can see if there's that change over time, which is why King County takes it so seriously and they give you so much grief about making sure you get your data in. All right, thank you, Heather, for being our tour guide there. Let's, um, this time, instead of searching for a particular indicator, let's look at the boxes, these topic areas. So, for example, I think everyone, not everyone here, of course, but most of the people, if you're BSK funded, you're probably in the prenatal to five. <clears throat> so what you can do is uncheck the others or uncheck all and check just prenatal to five. And it shows you all of the indicators that are measured in that particular body of work. So for example, you'll see access to mental health services. Okay. And this is gonna bring up a map again with the regions of King County. And you'll see that Seattle is red, showing that 73.5% of kids need mental or behavioral health services versus the South region, which is in purple, where it's 69.5% of kids, right? So interesting. So you can kind of click around and see if there's anything interesting there. All right, and then let's see, there's a time comparison, right? Yeah, there's a time comparison tab where you can choose a category to compare. So you can look by gender. And then show only changes between 2017 and 2019, select show all groups. This is showing us the percentage by gender in 2019 next to the percentages by gender for, two th sorry, 17 next to 19. Right. So again, under this time comparisons tab, you can look and see, is there, has there been any change? So all of that, it is overwhelming. There's so much in there, but if you use the search box or if you use the topic box, you can start to narrow in and see 
okay, not only how is my program doing, but as an entire initiative, how is BSK doing? Are we really making a difference? It's pretty interesting. All right, back to our presentation. Just one last little detail oh, in yeah. the BSK yeah. site, um, being transparent about source. So yeah. in, in this site, they're they're very transparent about where the information yeah. is from. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, being again with that data check. Yeah, so be they're really transparent about their sources. They tell you how the data was collected, sample size. All of that is a really good sign. Those are that's the way that you should present data. It's a good sign that uh, King County does it that way. You can really, really dig in and see what were their methods. And I think that really helps you to learn about how it's done, but also just to check and make sure that it's being done, you know, consistently with transparency and without biasing the data. So thank you very much, Heather, for that point. All right. So I mean, we all know that data matters, right? I mean, a lot of you've been working with us for a long time. We've been hounding you about that. But the thing about data is we can really only use the data we have. If it's not in the database, it just didn't even happen, right? We, we can only use the data that we actually have access to. So we really need to collect the right measures. We have to ask the right questions if we want to answer the questions that we have, right? So we need to make sure that our data is being entered consistently and accurately if we want to tell a real accurate story of our communities and our families. So in our work with those families and communities, the people we serve are putting a lot of trust in us. They're trusting us to be good stewards of their stories, meaning not to blast out their name with their stories, things like that, but also that we're going to use the stories to learn and come up with new ways of making lives better. So to honor the people we serve, it's important to collect quality data and put quality data into our systems so we can be analyzing real accurate data. It's really all about the data quality, but I won't make you guess what we mean by that. We'll give you some definitions of what we mean by that. So first, high quality data is consistent. And that means that no matter who enters the data, when they enter it, it means the same thing. The same word means the same thing. If you said it was a home visit and somebody else said it was a contact, who is right? You should decide as a program, what is a home visit? Is it because it happens in a home or is it because it's a particular number of minutes, right? Define those things so you can all be as consistent as possible. So later when you see the data, if you see that it was a home visit, you know what that means. High quality data is also accurate. I mean, I think that's obvious, but it's more than just being correct. It's more than just that it's correct spelling, correct dates and correct details. It also means that you're accurately representing the lives of the people you're serving. So it is of course, incredibly important to have the spelling and the date and the details correct, but also you should be collecting data in a way that makes sense for your population. So for example, if you collect gender as female and male, you're gonna get a lot of answers, but it's not going to be fully accurate if you have people that identify as something other than male or female. So if you have non-binary folks, they are not going to be accurately represented in your data. So you've already biased your data or made it a little bit inaccurate by leaving out that option from your form. And similarly, a lot of organizations use those US census categories to mean race. You've all seen those like six or seven categories. And those are somehow supposed to measure this complex, nuanced concept of race. And it's just not going to accurately represent everyone. So for example, the US Census has never historically really had a category for Middle Eastern, right? They're only talking about it now. So the census has not been accurate for people who identify as Middle Eastern for a very, very long time. So if you use those US Census categories, your data is not going to be accurate, right? So it's good to make sure and really go through your forms every few years and make sure that those data collection tools are actually matching up with the people that you're serving and understanding. 
high quality data is also complete, right? Meaning that you have all of the relevant information, nothing is missing. And the goal really should always be 100%, right? Because missing data means you're leaving out someone's voice or someone's experience or their story. And it's no longer an accurate story of your families or communities. Not that you have to collect every single tiny bit of information about every person, but once you've decided that something is worth measuring, do it well, right? And then be as complete as you can. Just as we want our data sources to be transparent, we also need to be transparent. So we need to have all of the data in the system so that everything is tracked accurately. Even if it's a bad outcome, even if it's something that's scary to put in the system because it might make us look bad, it's an opportunity to learn. And that's all the more reason to be accurate and complete. High quality data is also unique, meaning that each data record is for one person, one visit or one event, right? So there's not duplicates. When you have duplicates, you end up having biased data. So if you had somebody who, um, so if you, a lot of the home visiting programs only have a few fathers, a handful of fathers. If you accidentally put the same father in six times, it would make it look like you had a lot more fathers than you actually have right, that you're serving. So just being really careful to make sure that everything is unique. And it also means not tiring out your community, not asking the same thing again and again and again on the same visit or on the same form. It's exhausting and it also chips away at your relationship with your clients and it takes your time. Nobody has time to put those things in a million times. And there are some cases where you do ask the same question so you can see changes over time. But for some question, once is enough. So if something isn't going to change, like racial identity is pretty fixed. It may, people may uh, change the way that they talk about it over time. But that's not, you don't need to ask that necessarily at every visit or country of origin, something like that. Even something like addresses, you don't have to ask six times in your intake form about address. And you don't have to ask every home visit, but maybe you have a process for every six months you check in and see if there's been an address change, something like that. So you know your communities, you know what's appropriate to maintain that relationship. And then, High quality data is timely. So imagine if you are the person who does reporting, you've had this scenario, but if you haven't, imagine that you're the supervisor of a program, you're going into reporting and you pull your data and you see, oh my gosh, there's so much missing data. And this is your chance to tell King County, this is how our program is working. This is what we're doing. These are the lives we're changing. This is how you tell United Way, you should fund us for another year but you go in there and there's just a bunch of empty boxes. You want to be able to show off the great work you're doing, but you can't do that if paper files are sitting on your desk or it's in your brain, but you haven't put it in the computer yet. Supervisors can nag you and pester, but then it might be rushed or it's half-hearted and that just is going to mess with your data quality. So when it comes to data, it's best to really set yourself up for success, meaning having dedicated time and space when you're gonna do your data entry. It's the 20 minutes after the home visit is over, you always do that. By the end of the day, you always have your data in. Like come up with the routine and a pattern and stick to it to make sure it's done, make sure it's accurate. And the, of course, it's always best to do it right away when possible so you can remember because things do start to leave our brain, right? And if it's not recorded, it didn't happen. And it's hard to remember all of the details. So if you've been working with us for a while, you know that we have these things called empower tools and we have an empower tool about data quality. So Heather, thank you, has dropped that in the chat. Um, so there's more about all of these things that we just talked about with data quality, that was kind of quick, but we have all of that in an empower tool. Our empower tools are free resources. They're just front and back two page handouts that describe different aspects of data please help yourself. <clears throat> when you're in there looking at that Empower tool, you can feel free to download any others that are helpful. All right. We've been on such a data adventure. Okay. So what 
what can we do with all of this high quality data? Now that I've convinced you, you need to put in all this amazing data in your system, what can we do with all of this? There are many things that you can do with good data. And if that takes us back to the beginning of the presentation about uh, getting that funding, staying motivated, all of those things, it's really helpful to think about how data is not just numbers, it's not just words, it's the stories. It's the stories of the people that you work with. And so it's the real story of families, of communities, and all of the hard work you're doing. So instead of just thinking about numbers, thinking about all the stories that you're collecting and what you're learning about the real lives of communities. Your data is your stories, right? And stories are powerful. They change hearts and minds and policies and outcomes. So data is great. And I hope that you can uh, appreciate the power of good data. When you have those accurate real stories, you can demonstrate. You can demonstrate that your program is working, that your program is making a difference that you deserve more funding, right? We're not just saying we're doing this, we're actually doing it. And here's the data to, to indicate that, to demonstrate that. Right? Those stories can also help you celebrate. Many of us belong to and or work with marginalized communities. And a lot of the data about communities of color, BIPOC communities comes from a place of deficit. This problem, this issue, this trauma, but data isn't just about demonstrating problems, it's a way of celebrating successes and resilience. If you don't already have a process in place to collect success stories, you should talk to us because we want you to have one and we're super willing to help you get there where you have a way of collecting and seeing all of the success stories of the great work you're doing. We are all more than disadvantages and we have data can really help us celebrate our resilience. Stories can also help you elevate. And again, thinking of the communities most of us serve and we're working with communities that are furthest removed from opportunities. You were talking about communities that are least likely to have voices heard and data can help that. It can elevate those silenced voices. It can tell the stories that don't get all the attention it can tell the stories that haven't been heard before. And stories can help you advocate. For example, let's say you're working with new parents and you've noticed that the breastfeeding rates are going down. When you're collecting data all the time, you can see when those things start to happen. You can see those trends. Well, it's always good to be curious when it comes to data, right? You should always ask why. So if you start seeing the numbers go down, ask parents. And so let's say in this example, the parents tell you, well, our bosses aren't letting us take breaks to breastfeed. That is an opportunity for you to advocate for moms, right? There's legal protections in Washington to be able to breastfeed. So maybe you have a know your rights workshop, or maybe you create a handout about rights. Maybe you start contacting employers and make sure they understand parental rights, right? You start with numbers, you dig in a little more, you can really advocate for people. So stories, the data you collect, are these beautiful opportunities to uh, serve your communities. So of course you're all data Jedis now because you hung out with us for an hour and 40 minutes. The data, the, our takeaways from today are really that data can be used for good. Now you can do lots of amazing things with data. Data can also lead you astray. So it's good to be a good consumer of data. Uh, stay curious, ask why, what's the rest of the story. Maintain that healthy skepticism that not all data is bad, but not all data is good. So it's good to produce and consume in a way that uh, has good practices. And yeah, make sure the data you consume, the data you produce are using those good practices so that you're telling an accurate story of the amazing people you work with. We've made it. Questions, ideas, thoughts from anyone?
All right. We can't convince anyone to ask questions. Of course, you can always email us or talk to us. We're happy to answer questions. Uh, thank you, Kirsten. <laughs> All right, for next steps, we really do, I mean, we love data, as you can see. So we really do want to know how you felt about the training, all the trainings you go to. Our evaluation is very quick and we take it very seriously and we need your opinion in there just as much as everyone else's. So please take a moment. Heather's dropped a link to it in the chat. And uh, we, we really take all of that data and we use that to make our schedule for the next round of trainings, right? So please take a moment, fill that out. And the link is in the chat. And then also, if you enjoy our trainings, of course, take the evaluation. And also, um, we want to throw it out there that we are happy to do trainings like this or on these other topics that we have for your organization. So if you are interested in something like that, there's my email, Meredith at the capacity I also think that maybe Heather's dropping that in the chat. And so if you ever want to talk about doing a training for your team or for your organization, please reach out. And of course, you can follow us on social media. We're not the most active, but we'll, um, we like to see what you're doing. And we're going to try to put more stuff up there. So we're just at the Capacity Collective is our handle on all of those. So we'd love to see you. <laughs> and thank you. These are all of our emails. So feel free to reach out to any of us, any questions you want to nerd out with us, talk about data. We love it. Okay.